Just as the lens design has been evolving, my fitting strategy has been evolving. I originally started fitting fenestrated lenses, but had a lot of problems with bubbles entering behind the lens during lens wear. Now I use a non-fenestrated lens design primarily, and I always want to vault the cornea by a minimum of 50 microns. And I choose 50 microns because the lens can actually flex a little with, corneal, uh, with blink and the lens can touch the cornea. I want to avoid corneal touch. So 50 microns is my minimal area of clearance under the lens. I avoid bubbles on insertion. If I have a bubble underneath the lens after the lens is applied to the eye, the lens is removed and reapplied. Whether I'm putting it on the patient while I'm doing my fitting process or my technician is putting it on the patient or whether the patient puts it on themselves, you always have to check to make sure that there's no bubble under the lens. I want the peripheral curve to align to the conjunctival covered sclera. And I assess that by looking at how the blood vessels in the conjunctiva course underneath the edge of the lens. Once I have that fit, I over refract and that's the end of my fitting process. So what exactly is SAG? Well, if I took an MSD lens and I placed it on a tabletop and I measured from the table surface to the highest point inside that lens, that is the sagittal depth of that contact lens. And the depth of that contact lens is adjusted so that it is going to vault over the cornea on which it's placed. Well, the question is, how do I select the lens from the fitting set? Where do I start? What instruments do I have in my office that are going to allow me to select the right lens for this patient? Trial sets include 24 lenses, ranging from 420 microns to 560 microns in sagittal depth. But Lenses are available in sagittal depths of 380 to 600 microns in 100 micron increments. Topography is not that useful. K readings aren't useful. What is useful is to just look at your patient from the side. Retract the eyelids and look at the shape of the cornea and look at the shape of the sclera. You're going to notice that you have patients who have fairly flat looking corneas and scleras, and patients who have fairly steep corneas and scleras. For the flat eye, what I would do is pick a lens from the low section of the set, from the low area of sags. We have a set that ranges from maybe 380 up to 560 sag. When you have an eye that is average, you pick something from the middle of the set. As you get more experience, you're going to get more and more uh, ability to be able to accurately, within 100 microns, choose the lens that you want to start with. So if we look at these lenses that you have at the bottom of the screen, the patient on the left has a penetrating keratoplasty, a sunken graft, and he has a fairly flat sclera. That patient, I would choose a lens from the low end of the set. The lens to the right of that is a patient for whom we would go to the high end of the set to select our trial lens. The next lens over to the right is a pretty average shaped cornea, so I'd go somewhere in the middle of the set. And the last lens is again someone who I would choose a, a very high vault for. So let's evaluate this patient. If we look at that cornea, that cornea is not protruding greatly. I would say that that's a fairly low sag design lens. but I need to see where the lens rests. The re lens rests on the sclera, so we have to retract the eyelids, and then we can get a better appreciation of where that lens is going to settle down to. And you see that this patient's sclera is not fairly flat, but it's fairly steep. So instead of going to the low end of the set, I would go to the medium or the middle zone of the set and pick, pick out a lens that I think would vault the cornea. Now I always want to pick a lens that vaults the cornea. I always want to be at least 100 or 200 microns higher than what I expect because when I put the lens on the eye it's going to settle into the conjunctiva and actually the sag is going to decrease.
Sandra Bokern's group looked at scleral shape in relationship to how scleral lenses were fitting on the cornea. And they classified the uh, sclera into five different shapes. As you can see in the graphic on the left, shape number one has a fairly steep fit. This shape would allow the scleral lens to fit further back onto the sclera versus shape number five, which has a flattened type of shape as you go from the cornea to the sclera. And so you can see that it's not only the shape and the height of the cornea that is involved in determining what the sagittal height of the lens should be, but it's also the shape of the sclera and how that will limit how far back the lens may settle on the eye. So now we have three patients. They all have fairly similar corneas, but if you look more carefully, you'll see that the corneas have slightly different depths to them, and the scleras are slightly different. So which eye would I put the 20, 420 sag lens on? Which eye would I put the 430 uh, sag lens on? And which eye would require the 440 sag lens? Well, let's ponder that for a moment. Well, clearly, if you look at the central cornea, you'll see that that cornea isn't as prominent as the cornea on the eye to the left or the right. And you'll see that the sclera isn't a steep, curved sclera. So that's the eye that I would choose the 420 sag. Now, which one's the 430? Well, let's look at the, le uh, the cornea on the left and the cornea on the right. The cornea on the left has a deeper sagittal depth and that also has a fairly steep sclera. That would be the 440 sag. And of course, the one on the right, that's the one that's somewhat in the middle, so I'd put the 430 sag. So that's how I go about choosing what, where am I going to start, what is the sagittal height of the lens that I'm going to use. I look at the eye, I look at the cornea and the sclera, looking at the corneal depth and the scleral shape. So let's look at evaluating the fluorescein pattern. On the left, we have our traditional fluorescein pattern where I'm using cobalt blue filter light from the slit lamp and the yellow enhancing filter in front of the objective of the slit lamp to enhance my evaluation of the fluorescein behind this lens. On the right, I'm using white light, a thin optic section. I turn the light up to its highest intensity and with the optic section, I actually look at what is the height of the lens beyond the cornea, and I judge that by looking at the fluid layer in between the lens and the cornea. The lens has a certain depth to it, or a certain thickness, and I can use that as a yardstick to actually predict or to measure the thickness of my tear layer. Both of these fluorescein patterns are useful. The more useful one, I find, is the optic section. So as we look at this eye with an optic section, what we want to do is maintain a very sharp focus. If you look carefully to the furthest left on that selection, you'll see the light shining off of the front surface of the lens. Underneath that is a very thin black ribbon of plastic. That is the material of the lens. Then you have that green zone. That's the floor scene within the tears and behind that your grayish zone is your actual cornea. If we look on the left at our fluorescein pattern, we see we have a fully vaulted eye, but we have no idea how far away that lens is from the cornea. We have no idea how thick that tear lens is. Is it too thick or not? We don't know. So my process in my evaluation when I'm fitting this lens is I want to look with white light in a thin optic section, high intensity light. I look at the corneal thickness, which usually is approximately 550 microns. And I look at the thickness of the contact lens, which may be 250 microns or 300 microns, depending on the lens you're putting on the eye. And I evaluate the cornea and the lens vault, the lens vaulting over the cornea, from limbus to limbus and actually beyond the limbus. If I apply fluorescein to the front surface of the lens 
it's a little easier to see the lens um, profile as the lens is on the eye. Some of the tears is going to carry that fluorescein underneath the lens, and then I'm able to uh, evaluate even more easily the thickness of my tear lens behind the uh, contact lens. Now, you have to let the lens settle on the eye after you fit the patient. The lens does settle into the conjunctiva. The conjunctiva is soft. So I usually wait 30 minutes to an hour, and then I reevaluate with an optic section in white light, estimating the thickness of the tear layer between the contact lens and the cornea in all quadrants to include the highest elevation zone or wherever the, um, the corneal uh, the cornea is protruding. I use the topography map, the elevation map, to actually show me where the highest point of the cornea is. Well, we're fitting these lenses to vault the cornea, to have a certain fluid layer thickness between the lens and the cornea. How thick a tear layer is appropriate? We know that when we're fitting orthokeratology lenses and we have two surfaces that are very close to each other within several microns or less than 15 microns, we have surface attraction and the two surfaces are pulled towards each other. And this works very well with orthokeratology. It helps to create the tissue change that results in the change in correction. But here we're fitting a lens that we want to not impact the shape of the cornea, but to vault it and to protect it. So how thick a tear layer do we need? Well, as I said earlier, because of the way the lens can flex on the eye, I usually like to have at least 50 microns at my lowest point, vaulting the cornea. And remember, we're putting this over an irregular cornea, so we have to look from limbus to limbus to see where our closest point is, where our closest association is. But what if I just went very high in created a tear lens that's 800 microns thick from limbus to limbus, would that be okay? Well, we have to think about two things, the DK over L of the lens and the DK over L of the uh, fluid layer. How much oxygen is getting through? If we put a very uh, deep tear lens underneath the lens, does that minimize or uh, lessen the amount of oxygen that's getting to the cornea? There's some debate about that, and that's something that you have to decide for yourself. Personally, I like to keep my tear layer approximately between 100 and 250 microns from limbus to limbus. It's not always possible because we have the irregular fit over uh, keratoconus or pellucid or post-graft patients. I also want the lens to have some tear flow behind it. So I want to be able to see if tears go behind the lens as the patient blinks. Let's discuss how we adjust the mid peripheral and limbal clearance values by adjusting the profile curves. As you see in this graphic, we have a choice where we can increase or decrease the mid peripheral vault of the lens by adjusting this profile curve. If we want to bring the profile curve closer to the cornea, we use a decreased profile. If we want to increase our uh, profile curve, that portion of the lens in the mid periphery further out, say we had a patient who was wearing intacts, or we were fitting a patient who had a corneal graft and we wanted to be sure to vault over the corneal graft, we might go to an increased or a double increased profile. We don't call it the base curve because we don't want you to think that if you want to increase the sagittal height, you're just going to change the base curve. That's all done by the manufacturer, by Blanchard Contact Lens, as they control the reverse geometry curves in the mid-peripheral uh, zones of the lens. How do we evaluate the scleral fit? Well, what we do is we look at the conjunctiva underneath the peripheral curves and we look for continuity of the very small conjunctival vessels. In this slide here, you can see that there is a very slight congestion at the limbus and 
perhaps very, very slight um, blanching of the vessels right at the lid margin. That is probably acceptable. If we look here, as we look over the inferior portion of the peripheral fitting system, we see the blood vessels can be followed through from uh, the outer edge right through to the limbus. Uh, not just those larger vessels, but the very small vessels. I don't really see any blanching there. Nor do I see any blanching here. The vessels are apparent. Uh, they're in their normal state. They're, they're not inflamed or they're not engorged. It's pretty much normal conjunctiva. And as I look superiorly, I find the same thing. Now, one thing that you want to be uh, aware of, when you have the patient look down, the lower lid can be pushing the lens against the eye and create what I cause, call lid-induced blanching. That is temporary, and it's just while they're in that secondary position of gaze. It's not something that you have to be concerned about. So very small light areas of blanching, uh, very slight areas of congestion, we can uh, accept. When should we be concerned about conjunctival blanching? Well, if you look at this uh, image here, you see a bright white band where the peripheral curve is on the lens. That is unacceptable blanching. Now, you have to be careful here because that unacceptable blanching can be temporary or it can be the way the lens fits throughout the day. If the patient puts the lens on or you apply the lens to the eye, with a little excessive force and you create negative pressure under the lens, you can create blanching that looks like this. When you're putting the lens on the eye, you want the lens to be drawn up to the eye. You don't want to press the lens into the eye. Also, when the patient looks down with the lid pushing against the eye, you can get lid uh, gaze induced blanching. So what I do is I have the patient look in primary gaze and I see, is this staying the same? If it's staying the same, and if it's the same five minutes from now, that is unacceptable blanching, as is this. Notice the uh, bright band. You can also notice that we're getting a little fullness underneath between the limbus and the, uh, where that area of blanching is. Now that may be an illusion because we've created such a bright white area on the sclera, but that is an area that is too tight. Once I've satisfied myself with the fit, the vault over the cornea, and the alignment to the conjunctiva and sclera in the peripheral curves, then I want to evaluate how well the lens is performing as far as refraction and vision. One of the things that I like to do is I do keratometry readings over the front surface of the lens to see if I have lens flexure. Lens flexure might cause might be a cause for not fully getting my astigmatism correction as I'd want from that tear lens and that can be adjusted by having the laboratory make the lens slightly thicker. I also might have residual internal astigmatism that's not uh, corrected by the tear lens power or, and not affected by the lens flexure. After I do my K readings I do a refraction over the lens. I refract using spheres to best VA. I quite often like to do this outside of the phoropter because it's a little more convenient and I feel I get a more natural response. But if I'm not getting good vision with spheres, I'll then refract with spheres and cylinder. I like to use my retinoscope and objectively see what the refraction looks like. I want to be able to correct the patient to their best vision. And remember, sometimes these patients' best vision is in 2020. I will trial frame that and see how the patient responds. Now, best corrected visual acuity can be reduced with these patients due to the corneal dis uh, distortion that is present and scarring or other corneal pathology, which might uh, uh, preclude us from getting a very sharp, accurate focus through the optical system to the retina. What should we do if we wind up with residual astigmatism? How should we correct it? Well, the easiest way, 
and maybe the most profitable way for you is to put the residual astigmatism in a pair of spectacles for the patient to wear over the lenses. When a patient has fairly good vision with their lenses, say 2030, 2040 plus, but we can get them to 2015 or 2020 with glasses, they have the option of wearing the glasses when they want to have that slightly sharper vision. Also, if the patient's a presbyope, we can incorporate the presbyopic correction into the eyeglass prescription. These glasses are going to be fairly thin in design and they're going to be cosmetically pleasing and easily accepted by the patient. What I do find is that when I prescribe for glasses, I don't just prescribe from one refraction. The lens takes a while to stabilize on the eye, and I like to have refractions from several visits in order to see that I have a consistent finding.